Well, welcome to the Fund2000.com Real Estate Podcast. Thanks for joining us, Luke. It's good to be here. Second time guest. I feel very blessed. So thank yeah. you for yeah, we, having we me like, be a part. We like having you. I like having you. And today we're going to talk about liquidated damages and the earnest money deposit. What did you think of the topic? I mean, this is something that all buyers always ask. Can I lose my earnest money deposit? And what is the answer? The answer is always yes, for the most part. <laughs> Although it's funny because you mentioned, so like first, without a real estate hat on, like just as the consumer, I was thinking when you said liquidated damages, I immediately was like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Sounds dry <laughs> and boring, right? <laughs> like, well, yes, but I, like it sounds important because um, damages, liquidated damages, that sounds important. But like I've always heard it on the, the consumer side. I've always heard it at referenced as earnest money, what you've mentioned, where it's like, it's the buyer putting it, you know, like, this is just generic, you know, like, that's what I'd heard of. And so it was more interesting to sort of dig in and see some of the, man, it gets really complicated. How do you make these complicated principles simple? Yeah, well, or, and, and, and this, this is the job of the real estate agent to jump in in this conversation. Once that buyer asks about the earnest money deposit, you got to say, well, yeah, but on top of that, it's even easier for the seller to get that money if you sign off on that liquidated damages provision. So we do have two right. different principles going on here. So um, it's an interesting discussion, but I th it's mind blowing to me that how rare we discuss this. Uh, yes, agreed. H how much there is that, um, well, I would say my limited experience in transactions is that it has never come up. No one's ever asked for earnest money. So that's where, I mean, you filled out a little form and sort of gave me the example. Um, and it was kind of wild to think about. Also, I didn't know all of the provisions of like uh, how if you've got a multi-unit, it changes things. And like, uh, like all these stipulations, um, I was unaware. And I guess I don't know how to avail people more of this. Like, well, let, let's uh, just get into like, let's, you, I want you to, for the purpose of this, this discussion right now, step into the shoes of the buyer. If I'm telling you that you got to put up money sure. and there's a little bit of risk that you can lose it, what is your gut instinct? Do you want to, how much do you want that earnest money deposit amount to be higher or lower? My you wanna... initial feeling is I want to run away. <laughs> <laughs> I am a risk averse buyer. I like, and so I think it's, well, and, and it depends. I feel like your buyer, your, the buyer mentality will change depending on the property, depending on if they really want this property. So I think a lot of times, and I don't know, this is me speaking out of turn, like I have no experience in these types of transactions, but I think, so I have a friend who did this same thing on a property in Texas. So they were very excited about the property. And I think because of the excitement of wanting that property, they were ready to put up earnest money to sign of secure it. It's like a way to, on a, uh, on a, like a basic consumer level, I think about it as like, sometimes this is like really going to be sad, but like sometimes <laughs> when you're buying on Facebook marketplace or something, <laughs> someone will hold something. If you use Venmo them like five bucks, like oh, well. to be like, Will you come and, you know, will you bring this thing? The downside being if you never pick up the thing or you don't show up to complete the transaction, you lose your $5. I mean, like at the end of the day, that's kind of the basics of what this principle is here. But I'm always curious, you know, as a buyer, what's your motivation to put up this money? Like, and, and the only thing I can see, at least from my friend's transaction, it was that he really wanted the property. They were ready to, you know, like, it wasn't like they had the immediate funds ready to, you know, like not all their financing was lined up, but they wanted to put something up there that was like collateral to say, we're interested if you'll work with us. And do you know and if I they signed know, off on liquidated damages or is that just a deposit and you don't know? I do not know. The only okay. words he used, see, that'd be the interesting part to know. Um, and I didn't get a chance to ask him, but like, the only words he used were earnest money. He was mm -hmm. like, we're putting earnest money on this property. And so I immediately was like, earnest, why would you do this? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, that gets to the point that I think most people do understand eventually is that the buyer 
has to show they're serious. They're putting up money because they are financially qualified. They believe that they can close the deal and they're going to put this money at risk, right? Sure. And well, you're also thinking about the, you step into the shoes of the seller. You all, you're as a buyer, you're thinking, oh, I want the seller to feel confident in me. So I'm going to put sure. up this money. And therefore, hopefully it helps them agree. Um, but then you add this additional liquidated damages provision, which is, uh, as reference, I sent you a, a blank copy of a purchase agreement. If you go to page 14 and it's paragraph 28, you have the option to initial that or not initial that. And as a seller, in some circumstances, I might want to make sure that my buyer is going to initial that and put up sufficient funds for an earnest money deposit. Otherwise, I'm just going to think this guy's not serious or not qualified. Right. Like you'll immediately jump to. And, and so that's where it's such an interesting um, method of sale, I guess, because it's like on the reverse side. Let's go to the seller side. Um, what are the advantages to a seller? For, for these things other than just the natural of protection for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you're, it's like, you don't want to, is this like a time saver in that I may waste time going down the line with this buyer. And if they don't meet all these things, then I, you know, then I get to keep this money and that's my sort of right. benefit or, it, or, or like, I don't know that that's your a, experience. Yeah. That's an important question actually, because the, the first question is, can I lose this money? And then the second question is, how does it work? If so, the, the first thing is the buyer has to default. If the buyer doesn't default, then there's never any risk of the buyer losing that money. But let's say the buyer does default. And um, what happens? Does the money just disappear? Where is the money? I mean, so right. at the beginning of the transaction, the buyer puts that earnest money deposit into an escrow account. You hire an escrow company, they accept that deposit. Maybe you write a check or wire the funds. And then uh, the escrow company just holds it there. And then let's say there's a buyer default. Let's say a couple of weeks pass or no, let's say that you just never close. Let's say two months passed. And now you know that the buyer failed to close. And during that two months, the property lost value. Now the seller's thinking, man, I had a contract, the buyer defaulted, and now the property is worth less. I am damaged. So the seller has to um, prove the default and that's going to be easy to prove in that case because they had an agreement. The buyer didn't close. Um, and then the the seller has to bring, usually under the purchase agreement, mediation. If the mediation doesn't work out in the seller's favor, then they're going to take it to arbitration. If the arbitration doesn't work out the way the seller doesn't uh, wants it to work out, then the seller can take it to court. So it's not like there's an immediate automatic forfeiture. There's still its process. Right. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of like because that's what I, you know, that was what I was curious about. I was like, why even, why have these as a as a thing? Like, why does this exist? Other than, I mean, I get that there are riskier transactions where you're, you know, you might not, you don't, you're not sure if you're going to close. I didn't even consider the aspect of maybe in two months your property is less is worth less. Like the. Mm -hmm immediacy of the value at that point where you've struck the deal versus where it will be. And I don't know, interesting on the buyer side, I would think maybe I'll just take the hit and then buy it at the cheaper rate. I don't know. Like I'd never thought about that, but. Well, you're a smart guy, Luke. I'm surprised. I mean, you're thinking about all these things because this is part of what I wanted to talk about. So you're actually going down my script and I have no idea that you're going to be doing that. So that is if you're a super business savvy commercial person and you're not sure if you can get financing for this $5 million property, but you've got the budget, you, you know that you can you can take a, a $10,000 hit. So you're going to put earnest money deposit up. The property has just been sitting there. You think that the seller is going to accept your, your offer, at least some of the provisions. So you're going to say, I think they'll accept $10,000 earnest money, but I know they're not going to accept me having a contingency for financing because that's risky for them just to be waiting. So they don't want to be tied up for a year. Some of these deals take a year. I mean, that's in commercial. So let's say that you have, you're going to put up $10,000 and you know that you're probably likely going to default because you know that you're probably not going to get financing. You know that you're giving right. up that ten thousand dollars, and you're agreeing up front that this is the liquidated damages. He can't come after me for more money. Right. 
Uh, that's good. that's a feature. Man, yeah, that's a. Uh, it, it's like I don't know. Initially, when I was reading about it, I kind of was like, I don't understand who's getting into these transactions. But yeah. as we talk about it more, I can see, especially on the commercial side, some of the advantages, especially what well, you just talked about. Well, even with um, on the buyer side in the residential markets, we're in so many. Uh, I don't know. Um, situations where there's competitive bidding and True. we um i've got some clients in bakersfield they're actually here but they want to buy a house in bakersfield and they um they had to write an offer after a lot of discussion lots of failed offers nothing getting accepted because the market is so hot for the houses in that price range that they're wanting to buy they're cheap mm -hmm. and um nothing was getting accepted so i said look you guys have fully underwritten this loan practically so your chances for getting um, a loan are very high and we can actually write into the contract that if the loan isn't within, you know, a, a certain interest rate, let's say the interest rates shoot up, then you have an exit to the transaction. But other than that, an appraisal, we can say you don't need a loan contingency at all. But if you default and don't get the loan, you're going to lose your deposit. They were willing to do that. Hmm. Okay. I didn't think about, well, on the residential side, I guess volatility really um, helps this, you know, why this clause is in there or why there's both the liquidated damages and the earnest money in that it, if it's a hot market, this is something you can put up and you can say, yeah. or it's a lever you can use as an exit or a like, because you're right. I, I was like, with the volatility of interest, you know, like we don't know where, you know, if your deal is going to be, Oh, I don't have financing yet, but today's 6% is tomorrow's five and a half or whatever, five and three quarters. I, you know, it doesn't matter, but um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting concept, but that, that'd be my other question is how many, I guess you had to talk your client through that. So how many of your buyers come to you with this idea or do you just um, tell them this is what, you know, like, I guess I, I'd be curious on what your approach was to them in here's a risk you know, here's a risk, but it might help with these transactions or how'd you broach that subject with them? Because it's well, kind of convoluted. It's hard to explain. Yeah, it's hard to explain. And I'm not even sure that all my clients always understand because some, sometimes I see the eyes glaze over, you know? <laughs> sure, fact, sure. More, more often You're than saying not. They... Lots of things. I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to interrupt. It sounds good. Words, words, right. words. Blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think a lot of times they're, begging practically they're saying I, how do we get accepted do I, and they're just mm -hmm. exasperated so it it does open their their hearts and their minds a little bit to those more complicated words but um sure. but so that's how we got there with these guys but um other people they're thinking okay I, I really want my offer to get accepted they're already you know familiar with the market so we have this discussion up front here's how we make this offer as attractive as possible and there are some things that sellers are looking for and they're also advised by their agents and i know what the agents are thinking sure so the, that's that's a little bit about it but um yeah it's true i forget you know with any transaction you've usually i mean with some exceptions here in california but you've got two agents so there are two professionals that have probably been over it and have probably you know and hopefully the seller can advocate just like you you know you're showing that value because i feel like the seller wouldn't understand that either unless interpreted by a, you know, by their agent or by, you know, by someone who's part of the transaction representing them, they, they would then be like, Oh, okay. Like, um, yeah. And one interesting thing in this competitive market is sometimes, or, or maybe this happens in less com competitive markets where you're not getting as many offers. They, they look at this uh, liquidated damage provision as like a potential reward because they're not, they, they think, oh, there's probably not much of a chance that anybody's going to buy this house, uh, but we're, I have it on the market and here's a buyer who's willing to put up liquidated damages. So if they default, then I get an automatic whatever thousand dollars, right? Right. I get some money for the, you know, for the event or for yeah. whatever, the exchange. Well, and uh, that'd be my other question. I, like while I was reading it, I mean, I wasn't so thorough, but like, is it really just all go back to the seller? Nobody gets any money. Nobody had, I feel like in every transaction, this is going to be Luke, the consumer now, because um, I feel like everyone's got their hand in your pocket. So 
<laughs> like, uh, you know, is it truly just like there's no, um, I don't know, I commission could, like, split? Like, could you get a yeah, commission off the liquidated gets a piece of that? Or I don't know, <laughs> escrow company gets a piece. Yeah, the mortgage guy gets a piece. The, I don't know. Like, I, I uh, think that would be an interesting point. Maybe we can uh, negotiate into that liquidated damages a commission for Luke. Yeah, a piece for Luke. Come on. Yeah, I want to be the guy with my hand in your pocket. Um, no, I, I don't know. Like, well, the way it's written, the way it's written is just to the seller, but you know, sure. th that's our boilerplate draft template contract sure. that we use. It's just for the seller, but um, it's a good point. You can, uh, maybe there's other parties that have some skin in the game and maybe they want a part of that liquidated damages. So you can cross it out and replace it with language that of course you um, sure. adopt and draft with the help of an attorney. Right. Well, that's where we turn over to, to Chuck. Yeah. Well, I'm not an attorney, but I, so we we um, hire attorneys and uh, we we get their expertise on on those things. All right. Well, um, I, I go ahead, Luke. What else do you have on on your mind about this? Um, no, the only other um, you know, other than the complication of it, or the you know, I guess the misunderstanding on both the sellers and the buyers. Granted, you have these wonderful agents that will hopefully help interpret the blah, 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 to make it a little more palatable. Um, you know, I think um, I can see the, you know, now that we've talked through it some, because initially, like I said, my initial response on reading, it was kind of like, who's out there getting into these, like these transactions? I like, and, and maybe it's just as I'm not there, I'm not trying to run a, you know, like a business where I'm buying up a bunch of rental properties or something. Cause like, if that was, you know, that was the case, you know, maybe I would be thinking more about these things, but um, as we've talked through it, I feel like I understand a little bit more of some of the advantages on both buyer and seller. I mean, while it sounds, um, it kind of sounds initially, my initial thoughts were, it sounds very negative to the buyer because it's mm -hmm. punitive to, if you don't meet up to those things, but on the alternate, it can be an assurance to the seller I mean business. I'm going to close this deal and you know that you're going to get your money and I've I'm so confident in that or I'm so committed to that. Here is, you know, here's a promise on that. Now at the same time, we've just discussed how I mean <laughs> in the commercial transaction that could be you could still be getting taken. But that's all right. I think um I mean understand them a little bit better i can see a lot of the confusion around them especially i mean in in the document you sent there was all this references of multi-units oh yeah you've got to sign that same deal across every mm -hmm. unit that is it's not just one so there's you know the liquidated damages is not one contract now we're we're talking if it's let's say i'm buying a duplex or a triplex or something mm -hmm. yeah the rule and is I'm, different if you have a multi-unit situation that's more than four units but it, if it's one to four units then the cap on the liquidated damage is for a real estate contract is like three percent if you um mm -hmm. you could only get up to three percent even though um you negotiated more or even though there's more earnest money deposit in uh, escrow but uh, you you bring up an interesting um couple interesting points that made me think of an experience um i i've heard of situations i should say not experience, but like situations where I've seen people or read about people, not personally, I don't know these people. I've read about these people sure. who ha have negotiated purposefully um, liquidated damages provisions that were invalid and would be completely illegal and therefore unenforceable. And they, they're they knowing that knowing that they go into this agreement to get the contract and then there's a default and the court after litigation ends up throwing out the liquidated damages so basically there is no liquidated damages because it was considered under california law an unreasonable forfeiture so california and most states are have policy and law against unreasonable forfeitures so you could actually get your liquidated damages wrong if you don't follow the you know the rules that are uh that we have that you know 3% is basically the max that you could get for one to four unit that's one of those things yeah huh now that's interesting i mean like i was just thinking as you were talking about it i was thinking someone could just be going and making these transactions just to generate legal fees every <laughs> <laughs> just talk about everybody having their hand in your pocket but no that's uh you know that 
<laughs> that's getting away from the topic, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I can see, um, well, I can see the advantages on both sides. I just think as a representative or as an agent, I feel like sometimes it's hard to convey that. And that'd be my other question to you is, when do you feel that this is a topic you should broach? Like on both aspects. So on the cell, on, on that Bakersfield example, you gave us an example of it's a pretty busy market and you don't know where, you know, like, and so you kind of, you know, they were like, we're not closing any of right. Like how, what's something we could do to sort of sweeten the pot or whatever. And I guess that'd be like when you're looking at a property, let's say you're talking a sale, you're going to be a seller in this case you know, what, what's your approach or what do you think about when you're like, I'm, you know, like, okay, well, you know, like somebody comes to you and we're like, I'd like to sell this property. And you're thinking, let's make sure we get liquidated damages in there. Like what, what's your, you know, what's your assessment of that? Or how do you, um, you know, how do you handle that? Well, so when we're writing an offer with a buyer, we always have the discussion because that's like the top line earnest money. How much do you want to put up for your deposit? And then when, I just automatically always think, okay, this is money that goes, that's going to be that you're risking for this transaction. So um, how much do you want to put up? You don't want to put up too little because then the seller loses confidence. If you put up too much, then it's unnecessary for you to be out of pocket that much money and you're putting money at risk. It's tying up your funds, that kind of thing. Sure. That's a discussion I usually have with them. But then, you know, I try to have the liquidated damage discussion with them and then the eyes glaze over, right? right. I, and, and usually we just... Um, default to the fact that I'm going to do my best to help you make sure that you don't default on this contract. So this isn't even a concern. And usually buyers are going into an agreement with good faith. They don't expect to default. On the seller side, it's more like you get the offer and you're looking over all the different terms of the offer. And on some of them, there'll be this like red flag on the first page. The earnest money deposit is only five hundred dollars. What the heck? Why? Mm. What's wrong here? You know, it's a a million dollar property or a five hundred thousand dollar property. Can this guy close the deal? And you can negotiate. That's the other really important part here. All of these things that we've been discussing um, point to the fact that both parties need to be negotiating the amount of the earnest money deposit so that everybody's informed. And so that they are asking for what they want or offering what they want on this transaction, at least as far as earnest money deposit goes and liquidated damages goes, both sides have their perspective. Sure. And well, I mean, as an agent, would you be advocating more for the seller to all, I mean, clearly to always include these provisions, but like, when is it, when are you like, we don't need this. Like there doesn't need to be earnest money in this transaction, or no. are you always advocating you always have to. Yeah, there always has yeah. to be. Um, it, it, there, Some people might argue the contract's not even valid if there's earnest money deposit. It's considered to be consideration. Now, an earnest money deposit is not the only thing that constitutes consideration, um, but you don't have a valid contract unless there's consideration, and earnest money deposit is one of those things. Both parties sure. need to be, be exchanging promises and um, right. exchanging risk, basically. At this point liquidated damages make sure yeah. to get out there people yeah get your liquidated damages get your well, earnest money thanks for joining me luke and thanks to everybody for listening you can always email me at chuck at fund 2000.com and if you want to reach luke luke at sold 2000.com mm -hmm.